Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to our Tosca seminar this evening. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all virtually to the Bodleian Library in the University of Oxford for the last in our series of seminars devoted to the Historic Towns Atlas project. I know that many of you have been with us for the whole series and have enjoyed seminars, first of all, on Germany, secondly, on Britain. Uh, then we moved to Ireland and it's the final seminar this evening and we're moving to East Central Europe and very, very much looking forward to that. Before I introduce our speaker for the evening, a few housekeeping notes in case you've missed those in our rolling slide. Um, our speaker has very kindly agreed to answer questions at the end of the seminar. So if you have questions, and I'm sure you will do, um, please put those in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Don't put them in the chat, we might miss them if they're there. So um, it's the Q&A for questions and those will be posed by my co-convener, Nick Millie, at the end of the seminar. Um, we are being recorded this evening, but uh, no member of the audience will be visible. So um, you uh, needn't worry about that. If you uh, have to leave or have colleagues who weren't able to get here this evening, the recording will be made available on the Bodleian podcast uh, website. It takes a while to get them up there because we subtitle them and it takes just a while to edit those and get them into good shape. But they will be there. And if you've missed any other of the recent uh, Tosca events, you can catch those as well on the uh, Bodleian podcast site. So I think that that is all I have in the way of housekeeping, except to remind you that um, you will have seen the address uh, if you would like to be put on our mailing list, um, or indeed if anybody, any of your colleagues would like to be put on, on the mailing list. So let me introduce our speaker for this evening and set the scene for our seminar. It's a great pleasure today to welcome Kathleen Sender, She's Professor of Medieval Studies at the Central European University in Budapest. She holds degrees in history, archaeology and Latin philology, which is very impressive, also from, from Budapest. And her research now concentrates on medieval towns in the Carpathian Basin and Central Europe uh, with regard to society, demography, uh, literacy, everyday life and topography, so a very good basis for her to be involved in the Historic Towns Atlas Trust. A recent publication is Trust Authority in the Recent World, a written word in the Royal Towns of Medieval Hungary, which was published in 2018, and she's co-edited various other volumes concerned with East Central Europe and particularly town culture there. She's a board member of the International Commission for the History of Towns and one of the conveners of the European Atlas of Historic Towns. So she's a, a person who speaks with very considerable authority on the part of the world that we're considering this evening and also with considerable authority on Historic Towns Trust. So it's a real pleasure to be able to welcome Kathleen this evening. Over to you, Kathleen. Thank you very much, Liz, for this kind introduction. And uh, many thanks to the organizers for hosting this set of sessions and making it possible for us to uh, present our work to such a broad audience. Now, indeed, we are moving from the Western end of the continent, from Ireland to the opposite end, namely uh, Central Europe. Let me just uh, share my screen and then we will uh, start the talk. Yes, I hope you see my uh, screen all right. So, uh, Perfect, Kathleen. Thank you very much. Let me start with a map, since many of you are, I'm sure, map lovers. This is a map which is familiar to uh, many of you, uh, the cosmography of uh, Sebastian Münster, and it shows Europe the Queen. If we turn it to the uh, right orientation, 
you can see it even better how it resembles the continent. And within the continent, uh, Central Europe is represented by the heart and the belly of the queen. To show a more uh, familiar map, just you can uh, see that Central Europe is indeed East Central Europe, a considerable part of the continent, and it shows the true European scope of the Historic Towns Atlas project that uh, much of it is covered by uh, a series of atlas projects, which I would like to uh, show you today. I am in a very lucky position that my colleagues, uh, Daniel, Keith and Sarah, has already introduced you to the project. So I don't want to repeat all what they have uh, told you already, but uh, I would just like to uh, highlight that this will be an area which, uh, and that's the challenge to me, to present uh, where the towns and uh, cities and the urban landscape may not be so familiar to you as uh, in Ireland or in uh, Great Britain. But I hope that you also take this as an invitation to discover similarities or differences uh, to the world which is more familiar to you and hopefully maybe even in person. The agenda for today will uh, first comprise uh, the list of historic towns uh, atlas projects in uh, Central Europe. We will look at the original maps which are used to uh, prepare the atlases and the edited maps which are uh, based on these originals. And uh, finally, I will also show a couple of examples of how these can be used for comparative research projects in the field of morphology and topography. And uh, finally, uh, we will see how, and I hope by that time, you will agree that we all serve one goal in uh, multiple ways. Instead of uh, repeating uh, the goal of the, the Historic Towns Atlas and the constituent parts, let me just uh, start with a quote by Angret Sims, uh, the grand dame of uh, the Historic Towns Atlas project. Uh, she in a volume edited by her and Howard Clark on Lords and Towns, which was a result of a common uh, conference by many of the Atlas uh, project participants. She expressed uh, her thoughts about this project being a work in the spirit of reconciliation and uh, also emphasizing that this should contribute to a better understanding of common European roots. This was written in 2015 in a much more optimistic scenario than what we are experiencing nowadays. But I think it's all the more important to think about reconciliation and think about understanding. Maybe not roots, but perhaps rather influences or impact, but uh, we will see through some of the examples today. And if we speak about impact and influence, uh, I have to pay tribute to three important persons from uh, this project and from institutions which have been very impactful in uh, initiating uh, the extension of this project to East Central Europe. Peter Johanek, the former director of the Institute of Comparative Urban History in Münster, from which you have heard uh, Daniel Strake in the first of these talks, and uh, Angret Sims and Ferdinand Oppel, the two previous conveners, the first conveners, the initiators of the uh, Atlas Working Group in the Historic Towns Atlas project. Without their uh, inspiration, uh, East Central Europe would not be uh, so much uh, covered by, by atlases as uh, it is nowadays. If you look at the distribution map, which you have seen, I think in all the previous lectures, you see that uh, this part, uh, the eastern part of the continent, is not as densely covered as uh, the central part or uh, Ireland and, and Great Britain, but still there is a slowly uh, but steadily progressing number of atlases. Let's uh, have a look at the, the years and the chronology of uh, how these countries joined the Historic Towns Atlas project. You can see that uh, apart from Austria, which I will mention briefly uh, in the following minutes, uh, the great uh, bulk of towns in this geographic region uh, joined after 18, uh, 1989. This was really a decisive year uh, 
politically and also in academic terms. You see, of course, a, years, uh, a few years later, Poland from 1993 and so forth, there is a takeoff period for each project. You cannot really publish in the first year when you uh, start with a project, but afterwards with a kind of snowball effect, uh, by now seven uh, countries have joined. If we also include Slovakia, which will launch its first atlas, presumably this year, uh, seven uh, national atlas projects have joined uh, the big uh, atlas family as uh, the younger children. The seeds have uh, indeed fallen on fertile soil. I was really surprised and happy to discover a quote from 1966 by the renowned Hungarian medievalist, uh, Janő Szücs, who is very well known, at least in uh, Central Europeanist circles, about his uh, sketch on the three historic regions of Europe. This uh, looks at the allegiances, the loyalties, of Central European countries between East and West, which will also be uh, a feature of uh, this talk as we look at the mapping uh, projects later on. So Janu Suc has already uh, identified a need for uh, a series of atlases to show town types and their basic traits and to understand urban development in a better way than before but uh, he was not connected in any way to the International Commission for the History of Towns, and uh, his plans did not come into fruition at that moment. So let's now turn to the uh, projects uh, in the order of the playbill or the arrival of these on the international scene. I mentioned Austria also because geographically, if we think in a circle, it indeed belongs to uh, Central Europe, rather the eastern half of Central Europe. And it was a model, a very inspiring example to many of us working on historic towns atlases. It's uh, the most enviable project, I think, in the whole atlas family because it's a completed project. The uh, colleagues working on the Austrian atlases have completed their uh, envisaged uh, selection of towns, which was uh, 64 towns, different town types, covering Austria in a, a very dense uh, distribution, even moving over a little bit to Italy, to, to South Tyrol. This is fully available online. You can consult it and can use it for comparisons. The first uh, project, sorry, I think I got out of the presentation mode, so I'm back, I hope. So the first uh, project truly uh, east of the Iron Curtain, which was launched in 93, was Poland. You can see from the, the symbols at the bottom of the, uh, the map that the first few atlases were indeed a co-production with the Münster Institute, those marked with a circle. And uh, only after the first few years uh, did the independent production of Polish atlases start. They are working in three different uh, working groups. One is uh, in the northern part, uh, Royal Prussia, uh, and partly Mazovia, Kuyavia, so following the historic uh, provinces of Poland. Another project works on Silesia, and the third one uh, in uh, Little Poland or Malopolska. Uh, they are based at the universities of Toruń, uh, Wroclaw, and uh, Krakow, respectively. These uh, projects are very productive. You see that until uh, up to the last year, 34 uh, maps have been produced and some are in preparation. You see the triangle uh, symbols of which perhaps Gdansk is uh, what we are waiting for most eagerly. The next project uh, launched also very shortly after the, the fall of the Iron Curtain was of the Czech Republic, uh, covering uh, Bohemia and Moravia. Again, you can see a very dense, uh, very even uh, distribution of towns with uh, 35, uh, 31 examples. And all these are available in a common map uh, platform. The next uh, project uh, following after a few years gap was that of, of Romania. Again, uh, 
in three subseries of uh, Moldavia, Wallachia, and Transylvania, following uh, again the historic uh, division of uh, present day Romania, uh, from which Transylvania used to belong to uh, historical Hungary or uh, to the Habsburg Empire, depending on the way you look at it. And they have a rule of publishing one uh, atlas for each region and then taking turns for uh, the editorial effort, which is based in uh, the town of Sibiu that has not uh, published its own atlas yet in uh, southern Transylvania. The next project, project to be launched uh, was Croatia. Unfortunately, it's at the moment a, a dormant uh, project. Uh, five atlases were published in fairly quick sequence in uh, modern day uh, Slavonian uh, part of Croatia. But uh, unfortunately, the, the very rich and very exciting uh, Dalmatian cities have not been included in this project yet. But we can hope that with a renewed uh, personal effort, this will uh, continue. Then we, we get to Hungary, the project which I have been uh, mostly involved with uh, in person. This project uh, is uh, also one of the, the late comers, one of the Benjamins of the uh, Atlas family. And uh, we have tried to cover also the different town types and uh, different geographical distributions in the country. We have started work on 19 uh, towns and cities and have published eight of those so far. The others uh, should follow in the, the next few years. The situation with Hungary is uh, that many of the, the more urbanized parts are now parts of the neighboring countries. So we are seeking uh, collaboration and we are eagerly awaiting the publication of atlases from Slovakia, Romania, uh, Croatia, and so forth, which uh, will add to our knowledge about of the topography and morphology of uh, Hungarian towns in a historic perspective. And with this, we have reached uh, the penultimate uh, country which joined the historic towns uh, atlas series, namely Ukraine. You see that uh, those uh, four towns which have been produced all are situated in the western part of the country. This uh, hangs together very much with the availability of uh, suitable sources and also, unfortunately, the unavailability or inaccessibility of uh, sources which are currently kept in, in Russian archives uh, for, for the Ukraine. And here, let me pause uh, a little bit in the, the series of introducing the uh, various atlas projects, namely to, to look at uh, a couple of slides which were uh, at the induction meeting of the uh, Ukrainian series that was held in uh, 2013. And uh, at that time, we still didn't expect uh, those uh, calamities, those terrible actions which are happening in the Ukraine. So let me quote uh, a few sentences from the statement by, by Miron Kapral, uh, the leader of the Ukrainian uh, Atlas project. You, as you can read here, uh, he wrote that the first volume of the Ukrainian Historic Towns Atlas was published in 2014, and Russia began aggression in the Crimea and Donbas. After that, one of the main goals of the European Historic Towns Atlas became even clearer to us to preserve the historical heritage uh, of our towns for the future. Even in the previous talks, uh, my colleagues were speaking about uh, post-war reconstruction and uh, reconciliation. Then of course the war meant the Second World War. And uh, very sadly, now the war means something completely different in the context of Ukraine. And uh, I would just like to wish uh, from here uh, strength and courage to our colleagues uh, to keep up the good work and in the hope of really uh, peace and reconciliation in the foreseeable future. Let's move on to uh, the, the very last uh, of the, the series, 
which is in the process of, of being launched, perhaps in a few weeks or a couple of months. This is the first fully online uh, atlas in uh, East Central Europe. Uh, the colleagues started very ambitiously with the two biggest uh, cities of Slovakia, Bratislava and Košice. And uh, they started from uh, a project uh, which was already online for uh, Bratislava, recording various uh, images, photos, historic maps, connecting them to certain places. This is this, is this palm map uh, site, which I am mentioning here. And this became connected. So in a way, the gazetteer part, I will talk about it a little bit later. The gazetteer part was earlier than uh, the Atlas uh, project itself. So we are looking very much forward and uh, beta version of the Atlas has been already shared with us. And uh, from that, I can also uh, show you a couple of excerpts in the later slides. So with this, we have uh, reached uh, the full range of atlases. Of course, I cannot uh, do justice to seven uh, projects in the following when showing examples of the original and the edited maps, but I hope that a fair selection can give you a taster and uh, encourage you to look into the online presence or even get hold of the printed versions by the atlases and uh, get acquainted with the towns in that context. Looking back and also looking forward to the next uh, sections of my talk, uh, let me uh, point out a few points in common. First of all, which has already been mentioned, uh, these countries joined the project after uh, 1989, which shows that previously uh, topographic information was classified, was not readily available, and also uh, the intent of working was partially there, but not in the same framework with uh, the already existing Atlas project. And this changed uh, dramatically after the political changes. Uh, another interesting uh, feature, which makes, uh, in my view, Central Europe a valid uh, point of analytical framework, is that there are uh, similar, often the very same uh, mapping projects which form the common source basis of uh, the atlases for East Central Europe. Uh, these are uh, very often imperial projects. So this uh, refers back to, to Janusz Suchi's question about where, what kind of influences, what uh, allegiances uh, define the structures in, in Central Europe. Some of these cartographic projects uh, come from empires uh, further west, uh, the Prussian and the Habsburg empires, and also from the east, uh, cartographic projects run by the Russian empire in its own time uh, play a role for especially the eastern half of this, uh, this region. So this binds uh, together many of the Atlas projects. Also, there are similar kinds of historical maps and views and uh, military cartography and the uh, very uh, frequent and very disturbing military events uh, play the role in uh, the creation of these uh, cartographic and topographic representations. And this also um, adds to the fact, which my colleagues have already pointed out in the previous talks, that uh, Central European atlases uh, introduced an, the addition of an extensive set of uh, original or reproduced uh, cartographic and uh, visual materials. Also, um, we have to point out a profound influence of political crisis, which resulted in major shifts in the political borders. I've already mentioned the case of Hungary, but Poland is perhaps even more striking, with first the partitions and then moving its borders. In any case, uh, whichever country we are looking at, uh, the current borders are seldom the same as historic borders were. And that necessitates dialogue and collaboration, not only between the Atlas projects, but also uh, between historical studies in general. So let's uh, start now with uh, the original maps. Uh, 
first uh, and the most extensive uh, projects were run uh, by, by the Habsburg Empire. And if you look at the seven projects I have uh, briefly presented to you, and of course also Austria as, as number eight, then all of them have parts for which the Habsburg mapping projects were relevant. They don't cover, or this project doesn't cover the entirety of this region. There are parts, especially in the, the northeastern and uh, northwestern corners, which are not covered uh, by uh, this extensive cadastral mapping, but uh, it's uh, the most uh, relevant undertaking which we can use for editing our atlases. You can see three examples here, uh, one from Poland, Vialiczka, a very important salt mining town, where you can see from the uh, prevalence of yellow buildings that in the 19th century still, or maybe again, uh, much of the building stock was uh, made of wood or partially of wood. You can see uh, the extent of the project uh, to Hungary, which started only with a delay after the defeat of the 48-49 the uh, freedom fight. And the project was extended uh, further east and further south, including Croatia in the 1860s. So what the Austrian colleagues and the Austrian Atlas calls the Francis Seysche uh, Landesaufnahme, that is not Francis Seysche, not in the period of Emperor Francis I, but in much later decades in uh, the eastern part of the empire. It also means that there was a greater impact of uh, industrialization, although it went slower than in the western part of the continent. I will point out if uh, this has an impact on the, the maps. You can also see in case of the, the Kuseg uh, example how um, later use, later additions uh, show that these maps were in active administrative uh, use all through or for many decades of their existence, which of course also impacts their condition, their preservation and their use for the editorial work. This uh, series followed the same principle as uh, the Ordnance Survey, namely that the central parts were surveyed in greater detail. Here I just show two sheets of uh, the town of Schopron, which uh, Odenburg, as it uh, is in its German name. That's another question which I don't have time to go into now, but naming use of languages in this region is much more complex and uh, much more uh, politically conditioned than probably in any other part of Europe. Uh, and these uh, parts of the, the interior uh, sections should fit into uh, this framework, which show the suburbs. And here, for instance, you can see the Bahnhof, the railway station, which was already in place in 1856 uh, when this survey was made. And um, but otherwise, uh, the town was mainly contained within its uh, medieval, early modern uh, extent and framework. The situation is much more complicated and, and difficult in case of the, those parts which were not under Habsburg rule in Central Europe in the time of the, the cadastral survey, but under Russian or uh, Prussian rule. Roman Chaya has uh, presented in, in a very important methodological article, how the earliest surveys uh, from the eastern uh, part or northeastern part of Poland can be used uh, and how very fragmentary evidence can be uh, still put to good use with uh, hard editorial work. You can also see that in uh, Prussian times, different cartographic conventions uh, were uh, present in Silesia or in the Western sections of Poland. So that requires also a different uh, editorial uh, concept and, and attitudes. So these are uh, the cadastral maps used for uh, the base map, which I will show a few examples after we have uh, seen the original maps. The other very important uh, survey, which was comprising the, the entire uh, Habsburg empire, 
were a series of military surveys. The first one in the late 18th century, then uh, another series of uh, surveys in the, in the mid 19th, and then a third series in the, the late 19th uh, century. So these provide us with a, a set of uh, maps which are very much suitable for uh, the topographic maps which show these towns in their broader context, as you have heard about it from my colleagues before. These are at the scale of uh, 1 to 25,000 or rescaled in the publication or 1 to 50,000, depending on the, the cut and the editorial concept. And these show very important uh, features about the site selection criteria, the reasons why the certain places attracted urban presence over time. I show here the example of, of Shoprom, which you have seen in detail before in a funnel position. You can see the very important mining town of uh, Gutenberg or Kutnahora in Bohemia among the mountains. And you, have, you can see here uh, the town of Lviv uh, in Western Ukraine, also at the meeting point of mountainous and, and flatland. And it's a uh, very strategic position. In other cases where the Habsburg mapping projects uh, did not um, stretch out or not in the earliest period at least, uh, the similar military maps, uh, similar enterprises uh, were done by the Russian Empire in the time period when they occupied areas of, uh, for instance, Moldavia or uh, the eastern part of Poland after the partition. And this is um, thanks to uh, the kind sharing of Dan Dumitri Jakob that I can show you uh, the result of a very recent discovery of uh, maps pertaining to, to modern day Romania in Russian archives. And these allow our colleagues working on the Romanian atlases to map in much greater detail early phases of um, towns in Moldavia. For instance, here you can see the town of Roman in the central part of Moldavia and how this military map also shows the settlement in a, a great level of detail with uh, the seat of the bishopric, with the princely seat and the commercial quarters and the street network uh, stretching out uh, north of the, the bishopric and uh, the princely seat. You can see from the, the script that this was indeed made uh, by the Russian uh, military cartography. Very accurate, very interesting uh, examples. As you uh, understand, military needs uh, required an accurate presentation of uh, communication networks, of natural conditions, the flood plains, flooded areas of rivers, all that would influence the movement of troops but uh, it can also be converted to the much more peaceful task of uh, reconstructing urban topography of early uh, development. Military maps also form an important source basis when we turn to the plans and uh, depictions of individual towns. Just a, a couple of examples. Here you can see the impact of the Ottoman Wars, which uh, characterized the uh, situation in the central part of Hungary for much of the, the seventh, uh, 16th and 17th centuries, which uh, became part uh, of the Ottoman Empire and which were regularly surveyed, especially at time of campaigns by uh, Italian or uh, German military architects. This uh, map here, uh, both maps refer to the same locality, namely Pech, which is the, the last publication in the Hungarian Atlas series. You can uh, spot the difference between uh, simple uh, military sketches of a, a siege or an attempt to retake uh, the town of Pécs uh, from the Ottomans and uh, a very accurate survey by uh, a military engineer after the actual retake, uh, after the expulsion of the Ottoman troops uh, from uh, the area of Pech. In the uh, case of Poland and also uh, Bohemia, it was uh, the Swedish wars which produced uh, 
an important series of uh, accurate military surveys. You can see the example of, of Torun, how the uh, planned and uh, fortifications which are in the making are shown. And you can see in the uh, example of two subsequent maps uh, for Elblang in the Royal Prussian uh, series of, of Polish towns atlases, how uh, fortification proceeded, or at least was planned to proceed in just a sequence of uh, less than 10 years, how these uh, wartime periods, this turmoil uh, led uh, the local authorities and the military uh, authorities to expand the fortifications. Some of it was uh, indeed executed, others uh, just remained as plans, but these contain very important information on the 17th century setup of uh, these settlements. In more peaceful times, uh, rather in the, the 18th century and later, we can find regulation maps for uh, town planning purposes, also maps of public utilities. They are, as I said, rather later than the military maps. Uh, the example of Gdansk was exceptional, as we learned from Roman Chaya recently at a, a conference that Gdansk, which will uh, soon be published, I hope, uh, could hire cartographers as early as the 16th century in a municipal commission, but uh, this was not the case uh, until the 18th century in other parts of this region. As I mentioned, we also publish a great uh, number of uh, depictions of towns in various forms. I'm showing here uh, a very interesting uh, map of Buddha uh, in the around 1600, the reception of the imperial troops, and also uh, a depiction of the town of Most in Western Bohemia, which was completely destroyed by industrial activities in the, the state socialist period. These depictions also allow to focus on uh, particular features in uh, the atlases, in this case, the, the Vienna gate, one of the, the entrance gates of uh, Chopron from the west. And they also allow, of course, for the comparative research of the same features, for instance, the town gates or the hospitals or uh, other topographic features uh, for a whole set of uh, examples from which these depictions are being made available. So with this, uh, we have made a very quick uh, walk along the uh, types of uh, original maps included, and now let's move to the, the edited maps. This uh, starts with the, the main maps or base maps at the scale of 1 to uh, 2,500, as you have heard from uh, my colleagues before, and these follow the conventions of the uh, International Commission to the extent as the, the source material allows uh, in, in these projects. First, I'm showing you uh, three maps, which are kind of almost identical twins as far as the, the color scheme and the symbology is concerned. One example, Eisenstadt is from Austria. Then the second one is Pech from Hungary. The third from Bratislava in, in the making. This is where I refer to the beta version of the soon to be published uh, Atlas. And all these, um, by personal connection between the Atlas editors, made sure that uh, the same color scheme is followed. Beside that, you can also see a very strong dominance of this kind of pinkish uh, color, which is the symbol of vineyards, which uh, could be a, a talk of a, a topic of a different talk. But you can see that viticulture played a very important role in. Uh, the life of uh, many of these towns. Uh, all of these uh, in historic times used to belong to the, the Kingdom of Hungary. In other cases, the source material allows a different approach um, to the, the, the base maps, the main maps. For instance, in the uh, case of Elblang, as uh, Roman Chaya has explained in, in his article on the methodological aspects of use of the Catastro maps, they decided to use an earlier uh, plot by plot uh, source 
which uh, surveyed the, the town in the 1840s, instead of uh, taking the cadastral map from the, the late 19th century, but uh, the same principle to show uh, the town in its uh, pre-industrial form with the exact plot division and the land use uh, in and around uh, the urban area is the same uh, with a slightly uh, different color scheme. And another example from the Polish series is uh, Szrodoslanska from Silesia, where a different color scheme is being employed. Here the gray uh, buildings are the wooden ones, not yellow as in the, the other atlases. And uh, the outer areas, the outskirts are not included in this base map, but uh, still uh, a degree of comparability is uh, quite high. And it's interesting to, to follow the development, for instance, here from the central core, a big uh, spindle shaped marketplace with a later market infill, and then kind of tendency to, to make a grid around it. Um, other atlases like the Romanian one, as you have, uh, you may remember from, from Daniel Strache's uh, presentation, are uh, reproduced in black and white, uh, although on the same scale, one to 2,500. And uh, there are plans to, to make this in color in the future. There are a series of maps. I am only showing one from each uh, city here, Braila and uh, Sebes, um, which show different features which cannot be shown on the same uh, black and white uh, reproduction. And uh, finally, a new uh, concept which recently characterized uh, the Czech uh, Towns Atlas project, namely to show the reproduction of the cadastral survey um, fitted or superimposed on the second military survey of the same areas. This was the basis for the georeferencing of um, the cadastral maps. And uh, since it's an online resource, then uh, the scale can be modified, can be changed according to the uh, needs or the research aims of the of the users. After this brief uh, survey of the main maps, let's have a look at a few other edited or thematic maps. One which is a standard element in each uh, atlas in one form or another is the growth phase map to show the topographical development over time. In this case, again, looking at the kind of godfather of the, the Central European Atlas series, the Austrian ones, you can see a very complex aggregate uh, growth phase map. One needs a bit of patience and careful study to discern uh, the color coding of the different periods and also this complex uh, overlay of text, uh, textual information and, and visual information uh, tries to compress as much as possible into a, a single sheet. This, this is one uh, possible concept. Uh, gross phase maps of uh, the Polish towns atlases follow this concept partially. They also have a, an aggregate uh, sheet of several periods, but it's only with color coding and uh, symbols, numbers, and uh, the appropriate uh, captions which uh, allow the users to, to discern the various uh, growth phases of these uh, settlements, uh, Srogaslanska and, and Torun in these cases. And uh, the Hungarian project adopted a different uh, principle to show the growth phases as uh, multiple maps, as a, a series which uh, follows the, the development in different phases. And uh, we decided for this kind of approach because, in our view, this makes uh, those features uh, better visible, which are uh, present and have an importance in, in multiple periods. But of course, with uh, the advent of digital uh, GIS-based uh, cartography, uh, switching on and off different layers makes uh, less of a problem and uh, makes this kind of distinction less relevant than it used to be when we started with uh, the planning of our project. 
There are also uh, gross phase morphological maps, uh, very often added, usually designed by architects and geographers. And these show uh, go up to the present, basically to the late 20th, early 21st century, as the latest editorial principles of the Atlas project uh, advocate. There are other uh, thematic maps as well. Uh, one uh, set is connected to archaeological uh, results. This is also a feature which is very emphatic in uh, East Central Europe because it was uh, discovered at the beginning, at the outset of the editorial projects, that uh, what can be reconstructed from the first cadastral map is not uh, the original town plan. Archaeologists have also pointed out several times, Matthias Unterman, for instance, that one needs to go further back than simply uh, the cadastral map. And these uh, examples, which I'm showing here, are uh, designed in this, this spirit. In Shodashlanska, you can see a kind of uh, find cadaster marking those plots, uh, those sites, which uh, contain important archaeological information. Other examples are more about uh, period mapping. For instance, the early Christian uh, archaeological finds, which defined uh, the core of the, the town of Pech in southern Hungary, or the early agglomeration before the chartered town in the 10th to the middle of the 13th century in case of Krakow, which was also detected uh, by means of archaeology and less uh, through written and even less through uh, early cartographic evidence. Another uh, set of thematic maps shows uh, various uh, Topical features, this is social topography of the, the city of Elblang, various professions, uh, merchants, craftsmen, and so forth into uh, different time frames in the early 15th and the late uh, 19th century, plenty of uh, materials for detailed study. And uh, in case of Chopron also, we included on the basis of ongoing uh, doctoral research projects at the time of uh, editing the atlases, various maps on, on social topography, on population density, building uh, structures, building stock, and uh, also a nice example of uh, plotting down various uh, features, in this case, commercial buildings, and interpreting the street uh, pattern and the interaction between uh, the distribution pattern of these enterprises and uh, the street plan of the settlement. These are just a few examples, and you can find many, many more interesting uh, features if you go to the online versions of these atlases. I didn't speak much, and I will not speak much, about uh, the textual part, but it's of course there. We have detailed topographical studies. The important element is that those are all bilingual. Either English or German translations are added to the, the local vernaculars of the descriptions. And uh, the Hungarian atlas, uh, the only one in the region so far, includes uh, a detailed topographical gazetteer, which uh, we have learned and taken over from the, the Irish uh, atlas project. Now, where next? Uh, of course, it would be uh, important to include further countries. I took over Daniel Strake's map from, from the first lecture. There are gaps uh, which will be filled very soon, like Slovakia, hopefully also Slovenia. And then there are also possibilities to move uh, further south uh, on the Balkans or further northeast in the Baltic, which I hope will, will happen fairly soon. Sorry, just go back. Um, also, the research agenda can be uh, broadened. And these are a couple of examples uh, which I would like to, to close my talk, which show uh, the comparative research potential of these Atlas series. The first one is a, a topographic um, example, looking at the distribution of mills. This is a, a very interesting and relevant question if we look about the energy supply powering the city, if you wish. 
and also the environmental historical impact of this uh, type of energy product producing plants. In this case, there are exclusively water mills we are talking about. This is an example from Northeastern Hungary. And uh, in another case, uh, a young colleague of mine, András Vadas, uh, looked at a specifically urban feature, not so much uh, just an interaction of town and countryside, namely mills in town modes. And here as well, uh, the Austrian atlas is served as a first inspiration. In Wiener Neustadt, uh, one can discover on the um, maps how uh, mills are planted uh, specifically in town modes. These mills uh, used the potential and the, the power uh, provided by the water, which had, be circulate, had to be circulated in the moats, not standing still. And that could be used also through the sluices and dams for, for driving mills. And uh, then he turned to a systematic survey of uh, hundreds of town atlases available. And just a couple of examples to show uh, which he redrew in a simplified way. In Wroclaw, uh, the moats supplied a big number of mills, and also in case of Chopron, uh, three mills in the moat could be identified. So this is uh, just one possible comparative project which can be pursued on a all European uh, level in the future with uh, the involvement of uh, full set of atlases. Another example, which is more morphological in nature, is the prevalence of the grid plan and the importance in East Central Europe. Some of you may have noticed the, the presence of this feature in the previous examples, which I was showing for original maps or other features. You can see a further set in Torun. You can get two for the price of one in the old town and the new town. Both follow this grid pattern with a spacious main square, sometimes occupied by town halls, in other cases, like in Pilsen, occupied by the main parish church. Lviv, after its chartering, these dates are all the chartering, not the dates of the maps, which you show here, also took up the form of the grid plan. And uh, some of the atlases go even further, especially Polish colleagues would like to highlight the work of Boguslav Krasnowolski in this respect, also go into measuring the geomet geometry of uh, the plot divisions and how exactly this grid plan was measured out, implemented on the ground, and how it changed, how it was influenced by existing structures, or how it was changed uh, over time uh, due to fortifications or other uh, changes in the ground plan. There is even an attempt uh, to connect the internal division with the division of the outskirts of the broader region. Uh, this is an example also from a Polish atlas, Sandomierz, in the uh, Little Poland region, in the southern part of the country. You can see how the colonization of the landscape went uh, hand in hand with the measuring of the plots in the central part of the settlement. And if you put this in a, a much broader perspective, then you can even connect uh, this in a global uh, search for the grid plan in the colonization of the new world. But this would lead us very much further from our uh, East Central European Atlas project. So to sum up, um, not only perhaps my talk, but also uh, all four talks in our series, I would like to point out uh, the advantages of the atlases and uh, encourage all of you, also those who are not part of the Historic Towns Atlas project, to use them and to uh, exploit the potentials, because there are a high number of uh, serial secondary sources uh, made uh, following a consequent uh, academic and cartographic plan uh, with the same scale, with a possibility of uh, calculate distances, distributions, uh, possibility to compare different town types. Some of my uh, colleagues have pointed to this. Uh, for instance, Keith has uh, shown the different town types in the British uh, Towns Atlas project. And uh, you can also use the commentaries, the textual part, 
to, to point you to sources, point you to references for a more detailed research. So uh, altogether, uh, if we can sum up in one sentence, uh, the Historic Towns Atlas project has developed uh, from its original conceived aim, which was uh, a rather conservative morphological focus to a very important player, a very important agent in uh, the spatial turn in historical studies and particularly in urban history. So with this and with this very nice image, which I learned to appreciate from Keith Lilly's work, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Thank you very much, Kathleen. That was absolutely fantastic. It was a really great tour through a huge number of countries, a um, large number of different types of atlas. And I was really taken by your final slide there, where you were able to draw upon the other talks we've heard from in this series. So from Daniel, from Keith and Sarah, and bringing it all together, uh, which I'm really appreciative of uh, in this great pan-European way and just showing how all these atlases can be used together uh, as a way of comparing the developments of towns across the continent. Lovely touch as well, bringing Lima in. Maybe that's uh, something for us to look forward to in a future series, but uh, I think we'll have to wait on that. I think just taking a quick question which came from the audience very early on and thinking about Lima was one, there was a question about Greece and I think I'm correct in assuming that Greece has not been involved in the project yet, has it? No, unfortunately, uh, the project is uh, hosted by the, in, or at least uh, academically hosted, not financially, unfortunately, uh, by the International Commission for the History of Towns. And we have been uh, struggling to find uh, appropriate members from Greece. Uh, unfortunately, due to personal circumstances, this has not uh, worked out so far, it would be great. And that's why I try to point out that on the Balkans, there are great potentials for going further south to Serbia, Bulgaria, and of course, Greece. And in that case, of course, it would go back to, to antiquity very massively uh, when one looks at the development. So I do hope maybe some someone in the audience knows someone who can be made interested in working on Greece in the future. Thank you. Audience, there is your challenge. So anybody keen to uh, kickstart a Greek project, you know what to do. So uh, thank you. I was really struck but towards the end of your talk about how you were showing the potential uh, to use the online as well as the analog maps and also the research examples that you showed. So, for example, the Mills project in Hungary looked absolutely terrific. And uh, have you got any more examples of academic use, research use, which have, has been made possible by the atlases? Yes, yes, of course. I, I think it's uh, the main aim to, to make the atlases not only uh, available in greater and greater numbers, but to, to have them used. And uh, a very important project, uh, perhaps my colleagues have mentioned it earlier as well, is the volume Lords and Towns uh, edited by Angret Sims from which I took the introductory quote as well. That uh, used the atlases for pointing out the importance of the seigneurial presence. Lords, uh, as it features in the title as well, dominated the, uh, the urban scene, dominated the layout very often with their, their residences or with their charters, which uh, order to measure plots uh, to colonize the, the landscape. So, so that was, for instance, a large scale comparative use of uh, many uh, towns atlases. Angret Sims herself uh, has uh, made a very interesting study on the comparative uh, location of uh, main squares, uh, town halls, and, um, and the, the main parish church. So kind of the core of the, the town, uh, establishment and governance. That's another example. Um, there are uh, ongoing uh, projects looking at, for instance, spa towns, which is a feature not so much in, in our examples, although there were very 
uh, nice Ottoman bath in several of the, the towns occupied by the Ottomans in uh, 16th, 17th century Hungary. But for instance, in Austria, in Bohemia, the famous spa towns uh, in Germany. So that can be, for instance, an example of a, a thematic uh, comparison. I am working uh, in a project uh, initiated by the University of, of Erfurt and Religion and Urbanity, uh, Forschungsgruppe in the uh, Max Weber colleague on uh, cathedral cities in context, cathedral cities in East Central Europe. So I am taking not only those which are included in the atlases, but for Poland, for instance, I could use very nicely uh, some of the examples. So these are just a few examples and I hope that there will be more, uh, again, perhaps inspired by this series of talks by Maybe. other people. I very much hope so. It's interesting, there's been a comment from the audience while she were answering that saying on the question of the mills, they never thought of mills on the moats around the city. So there's inspiration for someone in the audience straight away, which is uh, really good to hear. But what do you think, who do you think are the main audience for these maps? That's uh, probably quite similar to what uh, my colleagues have um, shown in the previous lectures, especially Sarah's lecture was very rich in explaining about the outreach. The Irish Atlas uh, is really spearheading, I think, in all European level, uh, utilizing the educational aspect. So students and pupils on, on various levels are very important users. And I'm always very happy to hear from my colleagues that they are showing the atlases in their courses to uh, students, especially of uh, pre-modern Europe as working examples. It's very nice to give uh, assignments. Each student can choose one, one atlas and then they can look at specific features and then compare it together in the class. So that's a kind of uh, practical suggestion to, to some of you who might uh, want to organize it like that. And another group uh, who has shown considerable interest is architects. They are looking at maps uh, for uh, partly inspiration and partly as an aid in their planning projects, at least uh, those who are uh, percept perceptive enough uh, to historic features, because very often the atlases can show why, for instance, uh, the road narrows down at a certain point, which uh, town planners may want to just uh, do away with and just broaden the road, make the access possible although that would be the, the last uh, existing trace of a gate uh, to the town. So also monument protection uh, activists can, can use these atlases very well to point out the important features in the towns. And also, and that's something which is very often neglected, and maybe I can use this chance to advocate it, that the plot pattern itself is a very important historical source. And when one simply demolishes a, a whole street to build a, a shopping mall or uh, develop an industrial plant, then very important historic evidence about uh, the origin and about the original setup of the towns can be uh, destroyed and only preserved on maps and not in, in, in life form. Yeah, that, I think when you were answering that, I was thinking back to Daniel's talk, and I think it was the example of Braunschweig, which he showed in Germany, and there was a very striking street pattern in yeah. the historical maps, which has completely been obliterated by uh, recent developments. But yeah, but I'm reverting to the grid plan model um, in East Central Europe, and this is a, a question from uh, uh, the audience. Do you think the historic towns atlases help us understand the development and diffusion of this mode of medieval town planning and urban form? For example, um, the standardized atlas mapping scales and the conventions, they offer a route for comparing urban forms. And it'd be interesting to compare the East uh, Central European grid plans across with other parts of Europe. Would you like to comment on that? Yes, yes, I think the, the question almost contains the answer as well as you, you read it out. And so indeed, uh, the great advantage of the atlases is that they both show uh, original depictions where the grid plan features, of course, they can only go back to, to a certain uh, length of time. So from the 16th century onwards, original depictions uh, can show 
the diffusion of this uh, pattern, but usually these go back to earlier times, to the 13th century, already for, to the mid 13th century, and this kind of retrogressive reconstruction methods, which uh, especially the Polish colleagues, but also in uh, some cases in Bohemia as well, and also the Ukrainian atlases provide good examples for that. Uh, those can show how the, the grid plan uh, got more and more uh, to a norm and not just an innovation uh, throughout the region. And with the uniform scale of the maps, also the widths of the plots can be seen and uh, their uh, the relative sizes of the grids. So again, Boguslav Krasnovolsky has to be complimented because he has made extensive studies on the various types of grids, because there are uh, grids where, say, the main square is uh, dissected by a middle road. There are grids where uh, there are roads uh, um, starting from various corners of the main square. So there are different types of grids as well, not only the grid as such, and the dimensions and uh, the connection to the surrounding countryside can be also, also studied. Of course, there is a huge practical advantage in the grid because it's very easy to have equal size plots, which meant equal size taxes, equal taxpayers, equal involvement in the uh, municipal matters. So since uh, burgage rights and uh, burgage or, or the, um, the burgers um, use for the, the urban community uh, were similar, then or identical, then identical size plots could uh, follow this pattern or could mirror this kind of equal uh, distribution of obligations and, and benefits among the burgers. So there is a, a much greater uh, issue that could be a, a separate talk about the grid plan, I think, and especially if one goes back to the antique uh, versions of the grid plan, also, when one looks at the, the French examples, the uh, planning examples on the British Isles, which Keith Lilly has uh, very uh, nicely covered in several of his studies, then I think we are really at the heart of uh, urban uh, use of urban space and distribution, and also this uh, seniorial impact, which I tried to emphasize in one of my previous responses, because grid plan is not a grassroots development. Grid plan has to be imposed by someone, an authority, which is usually the landowner or the, uh, the sovereign of the town. So, so that's another dimension when one can look at the power structures and uh, such aspects. Thank you very much. That's a really comprehensive answer. And uh, I, I'm guessing exactly what we were looking for there. Um, I want to move things in a slightly different direction now. We've got a different question from the audience. How easy has it been to obtain the imperial maps um, from the Habsburg Empire to use as sources? Were they made available in the locations that they covered when they were surveyed, or have they been held back and archived only in Vienna? That uh, varies from place to place. I think this central archival um, storage is even more typical for the Russian uh, military plans. So our colleagues in Romania just participated a couple of weeks ago at a wonderful conference organized in Yash by Laurencio Radvan, who is the Romanian member of the International Commission. Uh, they told about their experience of uh, touching archival fonts, which no one has looked at for the last 200 years and finding much earlier depictions of uh, Romanian towns uh, in, in those files than what they could have obtained from the Habsburg depictions. So, and there they reported that the, the Russian military archives was established in the 18th century. And even if the political circumstances uh, changed uh, drastically in the last uh, 200 years, still the archive uh, retained its material and it's uh, basically available as it used to be. Now for Vienna, uh, there is a, a central stock for the military uh, material in the Kriegs archive in, in Vienna, but there are copies, for instance, I can speak more about Hungary because I didn't have to 
uh, work with obtaining materials for the other countries, uh, but those are uh, available as copies. And what's more important, that there is a, a comprehensive online resource which uh, has been devised by a Hungarian firm called Arcanum. And if you look at Arcanum like secret, uh, but it's not secret, it's made available. <laughs> so uh, they have a, a comprehensive map portal showing the, the three military surveys, which I mentioned. And also for the, the 19th century, they also integrated other surveying uh, projects. So if you just Google Arcanum maps, you will get to an enormous resource of uh, military mapping or state mapping from the 19th century. Now, the situation is different when uh, one thinks about the cadastral maps, because those were intended more for local uses. And at least uh, as far as I know from personal experience and from some of my colleagues, the storage of these is wildly different. They are not always kept uh, in the central archives. Sometimes they are kept in the national archives uh, of Hungary, for instance. Sometimes they are kept in the municipal archives if uh, the collection uh, expanded in, in that uh, direction. Sometimes they are still kept at the land register offices where they were used uh, for centuries for marking the changes. Sometimes they are kept in museums because accidentally the museum curators were more eager to, to get it than the archivists or someone sold it at some point. Uh, so it's really a, a challenge to obtain always. And sometimes say one sheet is so damaged that one has to look for a copy from another collection so it's a pure detective work to, to locate the cadastral maps in various collections. Right, that seems like uh, quite a challenge. It seems like you need uh, a whole team of map librarians out there uh, making their material available and beefing up their catalogues to improve things. Um, I was struck by the slide that you showed, which compared, I think it was Eisenstadt, Pitch and Bratislava, and they all had a fairly similar colouring scheme and then you showed a couple of the the pol from the different regional Polish accent atlases which look quite different. I wonder if you could tell us anything about the editorial process behind the decision making in the atlases as to what colour should depict what feature. I know that many years ago we had long discussions for the British atlases uh, and we eventually came up with a, a satisfactory conclusion but what experience do you have across the East and Central Europe of similar discussions? Yeah, colouring is really a, an important feature. I'm not a cartographer myself, but I, I find it really very um, uh, crucial for say, catching the attention of the viewer and also aiding the understanding or deciphering of the maps because a, a wrong colour scheme or a misleading colour scheme can really uh, lead to, lead to mistaken conclusions. Uh, so in case of the similarities, that goes back to personal connections to, with those colleagues, uh, namely concretely Ferdinand Oppo uh, at the outset. So when we started our, our Hungarian project, then I simply asked from his cartographer colleague for the, uh, I'm not sure the, the right technical term, but this color codes, this uh, X, Y, whatever, C, M, Y, <laughs> so, so these color codes, which is in the form of numbers, uh, shows the different mixture of, I think, violet and uh, black and whatever colors. So, so we could exactly create the same same type of colors. And when our colleague Juraj Shedivi from Slovakia uh, started on on their project, then he asked us to to forward the same numbers or this uh, coding scheme. And I think that's a, a very subtle way also of showing. Uh, that these towns indeed belong together. They had the same king, they had the same political framework for a long time. So without uh, imposing any claims or any uh, retrospective uh, uh, statements, uh, just to, with a cartographic form, I think we can very nicely show what belong together. With the other schemes, I think they, when they started parallel to, each other, the Bohemian, the, uh, the Polish uh, uh, Atlas projects, 
then probably there was no uh, initial consultation or maybe they uh, followed the color scheme which was available in the originals or somehow imitated the color scheme because there were different mapping projects as i uh, mentioned some of the polish maps are based on the prussian uh, imperial cartography others are based on the russian one others are rather taking a local example because there was no plot level survey available in uh, in the general or countrywide or imperial uh, context so it also depends on the original what kind of inspiration it gave and how far a kind of source editing or uh, source uh, reproduction uh, aims were also followed as uh, daniel uh, gave us a survey of different uh, attitudes towards the, this main map, this one to 2,500 map. So I hope, and uh, in some of the previous talks, there was a question, I think, about a, a common European project. And uh, in that case, uh, hopefully the uh, color schemes can be harmonized in a bit more uh, satisfactory way than, than they look at the moment. Well, thank you very much for that, because I was going to ask, do you find that nationalist sensitivities complicate your work and that's it's, do different countries different nations want to go out on their own and make their maps look different yeah fortunately that's not the case uh, at least uh, among um, historians among cartographers there is rather a, an eagerness to collaborate to share results to share methodological uh, approaches. Uh, there is a cooperation, Daniel mentioned in his talk, on the technical side of uh, cartographic information, geodata between Polish and German scholars. So this kind of spirit of reconciliation, which I quoted from uh, Angret's talk or Angret's uh, article, I think that uh, really characterizes the, the common work. And of course, we would be eager. And one thing is, uh, that the selection of towns uh, for various national atlas projects uh, sometimes follows a different agenda in one country than another. So uh, sometimes you would like to see perhaps other towns being uh, treated earlier than the ones which are actually on the agenda. But I mean, it, it's not uh, possible to exert such kind of influence. At the same time, I think it's very important that there are there is a denser and denser coverage because in that case the borders uh, don't make such a great difference. So if someone wants to to study Hungarian urban form, if I may speak for myself uh, now, then uh, it's very important to have uh, say more atlases for Romania, for the Transylvanian part, more atlases for Slovakia, uh, for Austria. I think. Uh, the two most important, uh, although quite small towns, have been included in the Atlas project, uh, Eisenstadt and Rust. So for that, we can be assured. Uh, Serbia would also be important for, for us to join. The northern part of Serbia uh, was uh, one time uh, part of the Kingdom of Hungary, but also for its own sake, for Central European comparisons. So I think uh, that's my hope that uh, national borders and nationalist agendas don't derail uh, this common European project. That sounds like a great way forward. I, I'm, that makes me think almost of some, one of the slides that you showed very early on when you were showing the map of the distribution of the Polish atlases. And you said that in Silesia, there was a, I think it was in Silesia, there was collaboration between the Ger German publishers and Polish publishers. Can you tell us a bit more about that? That was at the very early phase, yeah. and that was um, conditioned by, uh, I think, the outreach of the Münster Institute. Mm -hmm. That was before I really consciously engaged with this, this project, but it was mainly Germany and Austria which uh, tried to help the, the incipient atlases. And interestingly, and I think very often it's difficult to, to divide the personal and the academic side, that both of those colleagues, uh, from uh, the Irish and the uh, German uh, academic environment who uh, had a, have a strong inf interest in, in Central Europe have roots in that region. So Peter Johanek was uh, 
his family was from Budva, it's Cheska Budjevice. So therefore, I think collaborating with the Bohemian uh, project was quite uh, natural for him. Angret Sims uh, was born in Rostock in Eastern uh, Germany. So again, a strong interest to work comparatively on a, a European level uh, comes from her background, her upbringing. So there's very often uh, personal connections, personal meetings for the Ukrainian Atlas, for instance, uh, Miron Kapral, who is now heroically taking up the, the work of the, uh, the lead of the Ukrainian Atlases, got the inspiration from Krakow, meeting uh, our colleagues and uh, editors of the Krakow uh, Towns Atlas. So I think um, the personal side, when someone will later on write the history of the project, uh, will be quite prominent. Well, that's great because Miron is in the audience at the moment, so he'll have heard that. So uh, I'm sure he's delighted to mm. have that endorsement anyway. Um, but I was just wondering, is the interest in the project, does it vary in different countries, do you find? Or um, have you got sufficient information to be able to evaluate that? I think it, uh, this question should be qualified a little bit interest by whom. So yeah. interest by, by the academic community is easier to judge because mm. we get feedback, we have uh, meetings, conferences. Uh, interest by the funding bodies, <laughs> that's a different <laughs> question. Uh, so some of uh, the projects, including ours, has to, to reapply uh, periodically after every four years for funding. And it's not all that certain that we always get it. So in that way, um, it would be, it is enviable that, uh, for instance, the Irish project has a, a standard home and a secure existence uh, through the Royal Irish Academy. I think the, the British Historic Towns Trust is also a very good uh, owner of the, the British project. So, um, the Münster Institute likewise uh, bases its activities on uh, a constant flow of, of Atlas projects. Uh, there is also a local interest sometimes uh, by uh, local administrative bodies, mayors or uh, developers. So, so that can be um, sometimes uh, put to good use, but uh, sometimes it's difficult to, to follow their requirements that uh, probably it's familiar to, to some colleagues in the audience that this atlas should be ready before the next elections. And that's not <laughs> the schedule we, we can work at or work towards. So, so there are uh, sometimes issues uh, with the support in, in that way. Okay, well, thanks very much. I've just got one final question for you, which I'm sure all of the audience are desperate to find out the answer. <laughs> The town we see behind you, could you tell us where it is? Yeah, this is Chopron. So that's the, that was the first atlas produced or published in the Hungarian series. And uh, this is one of the uh, original depictions, uh, topographic depictions, which uh, we added in the, in the visual program of this atlas. So this uh, road shows uh, the road from Vienna to Chopron. If I move a bit, you can see. <laughs> A bit Excellent. more of it in the, the map, and mm -hmm. you can also see a windmill in the background, yes. uh, uh, a church by on the roadside. And uh, if I may add, uh, some of the atlases have also detailed explanations of how, how these depictions uh, have to be understood, the kind of source critical remarks, uh, what was the agenda of the artist if he, say, uh, merged uh, views from two different viewpoints into one image and so forth. So I think that might be a good idea for other uh, projects as well to, to pursue this. So, so this is Chopron, you're welcome. It's very close to Vienna. You can travel there quite easily. What a wonderful inv invitation. Well, I think Catalin, that's a great way to finish this evening's talk and a wonderful way to finish this what's been a fascinating series of four different uh, presentations. 
so I think on behalf of the Oxford Seminars in Cartography and on behalf of our audience, I'd like to thank you very much for a really wonderful contribution tonight. I know you've been doing a lot of talking, so I think you might want to uh, have a glass of water and have a bit of a rest. But uh, as far as, as the Tosca are concerned, thank you very much. Thanks to all our audience also for coming along and supporting us over the past four sessions. And I'd like to also thank our support team who've helped to deliver these four sessions. Uh, it's been a real privilege to be part of it. So I'm sure the rest of the audience would agree with that. So all that remains to be said is, um, Kathleen, thank you very much indeed. Um, it's been a real privilege to have attended these sessions. And uh, thanks for putting in so much effort and to, for drawing together um, the previous three and adding it to your talk as well. It's really given the whole series a wonderful send off. So I would just like to say thanks again. Thank you to the audience and enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs>